Go Tenant, the revolutionary new property software built by landlords and trusted by tenants. Go Tenant is your one-stop property management assistant that will take the pain away from your tenant recruitment process and the management of your properties. From advertising your property to maintenance reporting, electronic signatures to full property management software. Stop worrying about double bookings and the hassle of unnecessary admin because Go Tenants is here to enable you to seamlessly run your portfolio from anywhere in the world. Go to gotenants.co.uk to find out more. So I thought I would do a little bit of content for you today. Um, as always, we like to put loads of content out there in the group. So I put a few slides together on how we invest in HMOs and why we invest in HMOs. So if you've got any questions, um, you know, click down below. I don't know how we're going to answer those yet. I think we were, we're monitoring the questions um, on our little devices. So we've got our devices uh, uh, here, so I can see what we're doing and making sure that the live feed is going out okay. So I've got my cup of tea, even though this is uh, uh, sort of 11 o'clock rather than nine, it's still going to be cup of tea with Rick G because it's going to go out on the podcast as well. Okay, so why we invest in HMOs, houses in multiple occupation. So who am I? So for those of you that don't know me, I began investing in property around about 1997. Um, we started off as accidental landlords. And that was because we had um, a property in Nottingham, for those of you that know Nottingham. And we were working in, the, in corporate jobs at the time. When I say we, myself and my wife Lorraine. And I got promoted in that job, which meant that we needed to move. Now we bought that property off plan. And that meant that we bought it probably over market value, which meant that we couldn't sell it. So what we decided to do was rent it out. And back then, back in around about 1997, it was really easy to get second mortgages. It wasn't hard at all. And because myself and my wife had a great job, we were able to do that. So what we did is we rented it out and we became accidental landlords, really, by virtue overnight. I then decided that I wanted a chain of pubs. Now, uh, we had a bucket list back then now they're called vision boards now aren't they and uh, and goals etc but when i was doing this at the beginning they were called bucket lists and i wanted to own a chain of pubs for some reason i thought it was a really sexy idea to be able to stand at the end of the bar and drink beer with the locals and i thought it was just really you know a really great thing to do so we went out and we bought our first pub and then that developed into four, five, and I think we had about six pubs, clubs and nightclubs towards the end of it. And then I became a police officer. So that was on my bucket list as well. And I think, you know, everything in life, we don't really know what we want to do. We just keep pushing forwards. And um, one of my main ambitions was to become a police officer. So I thought, well, you know, before it's too late, um, I decided to, we, or say I, we decided to sell our pub portfolio to a large company. They bought us out. We kept one and we still own that one today. And I became a police officer. And for the biggest part of my career, that's what I did. I was a uniformed response police officer. And I was the person that you'd expect to see if you dialed 999 um, and we'd turn up at your doorstep. So that's kind of what we did. Uh, and then I became director of New Era Property. So what happened over the course of the 13 years, uh, for many of you that have read my book, you'll know that I had a very life-changing moment and I had a conversation with my son after coming home from work one day and that was um, really quite heart-wrenching and it was really difficult to deal with. So I went home after a, a really horrible night at work and I spoke to my son Ben and Ben asked me why he couldn't play football like the rest of his friends. And it was real sort of um, a, a time stopping moment, if you like. And um, that made me change my career path. So I decided that, you know, we're only here once. Uh, we've got to make a real go of it. And time really does go very quickly. So I spoke to Lorraine, my wife, and we knew that property had always been good to us in the past. So we decided to go into property full time. And then became um, a HMO full time property investor a mentor and a coach. I then became a best-selling published author and the founder of GoTenant Property Management Software. So a lot's happened since then. So that's just a little bit about me so you can understand what my credentials are for those of you that don't know me. So my life now, well, this is one of our latest deals. You'll see that. You may have seen this. I posted it on Facebook. This property um, starts from here and goes 
all the way to here and we own all of it so really it's almost apart from one property at the end it's the whole street and it's just outside the city center in worcester and we purchased this below market value it was on for 1.3 million and we purchased it for 1.1 million um, and that's kind of you know what the, the big deals that we're doing at the moment so um, we bought that by sourcing direct to vendor so with direct to vendor marketing campaigns I've got two books, uh, you may have read them, House Arrest and 45 Ways to Find Property. They're both available on Amazon. And of course, I am the founder of GoTenant Property Management Software. <coughs> Excuse me, folks, I've got a real bad cold at the moment. It's a real stinker. And I'm also published in YPM Magazine every month and HMO Magazine as well. So let's get straight into the content. Excuse me for coughing. <coughs> this is a great thing about live feeds. It is live. I can't cut it out. Okay, folks, so this is it. So get a notepad and pen, and um, we've got about 35 minutes or so of education for you. So what is a HMO? What is a HMO? So a HMO is a housing classification. It's a house in multiple occupation. So this is a housing classification for a house or a flat with three or more tenants forming two or more households. Okay, so for example, a two-bedroom flat with a couple in one room and an unrelated friend in the other would be a HMO. Why do we invest in HMOs? Now, by the way, folks, that's not licensing, <coughs> excuse me, and it's not planning. That's just the definition of a HMO. Sorry for the coughing, by the way. So why do we invest in HMOs? Well, we purchase several income streams at once. For example, a six bedroom property would potentially bring in six individual income streams. And we look at a minimum of £500 per month profit per property. And that's our rules of investing. If we don't achieve that, then personally, we don't go out and buy the property or we don't take the property over because we know we can achieve that. We're also looking for a great return on investment. Now, we always work towards 15% at least because we know that we can get it. It looks a single let comparison. So if you look at a normal house, a normal property, your vanilla buy to let type property, let's say the property is worth £150,000. You need to put in £37,500 deposit because that is your, um, your money in. That's what you have to put down, which is 25%. So you're going to get a 75% loan to value. We're going to assume the interest rate is 6%. Now, we always do that because we stack our deals to 6%. If the market goes up or the interest rates go up, I should say, then we know that we're covered and we've got enough skin in the game. Let's say then the mortgage is going to be £562.50 per month. That's based on 6% interest only. The stamp duty on this example is going to be £5,000. A light refurb because it's just a single let property of around £3,000. The total estimated costs per month for this property are going to be £650. So that's your mortgage um, and all the other bits and bobs, the small amounts that you have to pay for a single let property. And if you are going to achieve £845 a month on this house, then you're going to make £195 profit out of a single let property. Now, that might be okay for you. I don't know. I don't know what your rules of investment are. But £195 per month profit for us really isn't going to cut the mustard. It's not really going to be much of an incentive for us. Is that going to be a good deal for you? I don't know. You tell me. So first of all, we're going to work out the cash flow. So the income is £845. The expenses, 650 Therefore, the cash flow is £195 a month. Yeah, it's not rocket science. Now we're going to work out the return on investment. The return on investment is your annual profit. Write this down if you don't know it, folks. Your annual profit divided by your initial investment times 100. And that gives us our return on investment figure. It's a really simple equation. So the profit for this property each year is 2,340, sorry, 2,340 pounds. The initial investment was 46,500 your initial investment is everything it's cost you 
to get that property. So everything that, you know, your mortgage, your legals, your stamp duty, everything, your refurbishment cost. So the initial investment is 46,500, which gives us a return on investment of 5.03%. Now, is that a good deal for you folks? 5.03%, I don't know, it might be. It's certainly better than what you would achieve in the bank at the moment. So it might be a better deal for you, I don't know. Let's look at the comparison with the HMO property. Now, with a HMO property, and if you can see this text, if it's say, you know, we say we purchase five income streams at once because we have a minimum of, we have a minimum personally, this is what we do, of five bedrooms. Now, that doesn't mean we have to go out and look for five bedroom properties. We can take hold of three bedroom properties and repurpose them. They may have an integral garage, that's a big win. They may um, have a cellar space that we could convert with building regs, of course. We may be able to just convert one of the living rooms um, or one of the communal areas into a bedroom. It may have a really big kitchen that you can use as a kitchen slash communal area. It may have a living room and a dining room as well. So we don't necessarily need to go out and look for five bedroom houses. We can repurpose a three bedroom property into a five bedroom property quite easily. So we're gonna purchase five income streams at once. So the property is the same, remember, it's the same house. It's 150,000 pounds, but now we've got five rooms cash flowing at 425 pounds per room. This is where the big difference is. So that now brings in a gross rent of 2,125 pounds. We allow for 10% voids. We do get voids, folks, you know. Um, when we tell you all of this and we give you all of our uh, knowledge and education, we tell you the good stuff and the bad stuff, and we do get voids. We've got voids at the moment. It's a really bad time of year to be selling rooms, but we are. We're still getting people, but actually, um, one of the girls in the office is checking somebody in today um, because they want to get in before Christmas. So we do get voids, but we allow 10%. So as long as we are within that, um, that parameter, we know that our business model is safe. We also allow for 5% maintenance. So, um, you know, properties do go wrong. HMOs have got a lot of people coming and going. Um, you know, they don't look after the properties as well as they perhaps would if it was their own. So we do get um, maintenance costs. So we budget 5%. Now I'll give you some examples here. Last month alone, our maintenance costs were, hum I was gonna say horrendous and massive, or how massive, that's not even a word, they were huge. We had to replace boilers, we had some drainage issues in properties, I shared that in the group with you, you may have seen it. Um, boiler issues, uh, we had to replace some cookers, we had to put new sink units in for the licensing, so we do get quite a lot of costs. So make sure you budget a minimum of 5% for your maintenance. And of course the mortgage. Now the mortgage, albeit, is gonna be a HMO mortgage this time. We stack the mortgage to 6%, remember, and it's interest only. So that means the mortgage is gonna be the same. It's gonna be the same because we always stack to 6% to give us enough wiggle room in case the interest rates go up. And of course the bills. Now this is the big difference because with a HMO, or with ours, we have all inclusive bills. So everything that we do, we pay for. So we pay for the gas, the electric, the water, etc. You know that. So we have that now to consider as well. And of course, folks, we're going to cover this in a minute, council tax. Now we pay the council tax because we only have professional tenants, we don't do students. If your properties are populated with students, ACE, because they will be ta uh, council tax exempt, or they should be. Okay, so now look at the difference here. Profit, £895 per month, which is £10,740 per year. Now, we're going to allow for a refurb on this of 25 grand. Mm, you know, we could probably do it for 25 grand. It might be a little bit light, if I'm honest with you now. Um, you know, the breakdown of, you know, costs are going up, labour charges are going up. But if we're not going to go for any frills and we're not going to put en suites into every room, we might get away with about 25k, considering the property's already in good nick. We've got our stamp duty, it's the same price because it's the same house and our legal costs, we say about a thousand, we can actually do it for a lot less than that, we can do it for about 350, um, but we're gonna budget a thousand pounds for today's example. The deposit's the same, total investment now is shot up to 68,500 pounds, that's obviously quite considerably more. What's the return on investment? 10,740 pounds, which is your annual profit, okay? 
divided by 68,500 times 100 gives you 15.6% ROI. That's massive compared to the example I gave you before at 5%. What do you think, folks? Give me a like, hit the like button so I know that you're here. I know that some people are watching. Is that a better deal for you at 15% return on investment than 5% return on investment? Now, that's why we invest in HMO property because I know that buy-to-let property is going to be less work for you. It's going to be um, set and forget. But you're not going to change your life with buy-to-let property in the next 12 months. You're not, okay? Um, because it's not going to cash flow enough for you to be able to give up your job unless you are out there buying 50 or 60 properties. And if you're in a position to do that, then that's absolutely fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with buy-to-let properties. I'm just saying that about cash flow and you know money generating property right now, you're not going to get those returns from buy-to-lets. Okay, keep the questions coming in, folks, by the way. I can see them. I'm looking down here because I've got a little screen that shows me what the questions are. We will come back in a second and talk about that. Okay. Um, actually, I'll talk about one now. Thank you. So Del's saying, good, good to see some of the challenges, e.g. voids being discussed, some refreshing balance. Absolutely, Del. And, you know, I don't know if you've come across any of our trainings before. We tell you the good stuff and the bad stuff. We're going to tell you everything. So stick around. We've got loads of content for you. Okay. First of all, what do you do? How do you start? Well, you need to start with your due diligence, okay? Due diligence is massive in anything we do, but when it comes to HMOs, it's absolutely paramount. And that's why you need to get education. You know, watching videos like this, going on programs, because due diligence is really important. So please write some of this down, folks, if you're not, because I'm gonna share some real great tips with you in a minute. It's gonna help you with your property investing, all right? Due diligence. Before you begin to invest in HMOs, you will need to conduct lots of due diligence, okay? First of all, and we say this, you know, right at the very beginning, you need to work out your tax structure, your company structure. What's the best SIC or SIC code to put your, prop uh, your property business in? Now, we can't answer that for you because we don't know your personal circumstances. So what we always say is talk to a tax specialist, in order to get the right SIT code, in order to work out whether it's best to buy in an LLP or in a limited company or as a sole trader, there's so much you need to consider on how to set your company structure up, okay? So make sure that you talk to a tax specialist, really important. The next thing you need to do is choose your investing area. How do you do that? There are loads of ways that you can do that, okay? I haven't got enough time today to go into each one of these individually, but you need to choose your investing area, look at the local competition, and don't worry about going into a busy market. Lots of people talk about saturation. Yes, it's important, but if you've got a better product than your competitor, then you're gonna do better anyway, all right? Now, if I came into my investing area right now, and if I did a, I don't know, lots of people talk about spareroom.co.uk. If I did a spare room comparison on people looking for rooms against rooms available, I would run a mile. Because I know that the rooms available are probably three times more than the people looking. But that's not a true comparable, and I wouldn't use that. I give that as an example because people do. Because people are on spare room for a long time. They don't take their profiles down. Sometimes you've got dummy adverts that people put up and it kind of skews the market. What I would do is talk to the people out there doing it. You know, we've got people in the group and, you know, people like to help people. Okay, so make sure you do enough due diligence to work out if your property or your area has got enough supply and demand. Research your area. Is there Article 4 direction in your area? I can't go into too much detail on all of these slides. Article 4 direction, I am going to cover. Article 4 direction removes permitted development rights in certain areas for certain things, permitted development. It's not always necessarily going to be for HMOs, okay? And it doesn't stop you from investing in the areas, folks. Don't think it does, because there are hundreds of HMOs already in those areas and that's why they brought article 4 out in the first place so you can buy those hmos because they've got the correct planning permission or then they've got the correct grandfather rights don't let that put you off okay but you need to know whether your area has article 4 direction what does it mean it means that you can't convert a normal house into a hmo under permitted development any longer if you've got article 4 for hmos in your area okay um 
Lots of confusion about licensing. It's nothing to do with licensing, okay? I'm going to use this flip chart here. I don't know if you can probably can't see it. Bear with me. Can we get this in shot, George? Yeah. Is it in? Yeah. Okay, folks, look. I want to show you this. This is really important. This side of the road, you've got licensing. And then you've got the road. This side of the road, you've got planning. They're two different departments. And they don't always talk to each other. And I want you to just separate this in your mind. Planning is this, Article 4 direction. That's planning. Licensing is just licensing. They will check your compliance on the property to see whether it meets the local standards. You can get a license without planning. So don't think that if you're buying a property or you're going into property and they say, yeah, you'll get a license, that's fine. It doesn't mean you have the correct planning permission. You need both, okay? If your area doesn't have Article 4, if it doesn't, that means you can convert a property, which is planning class C3, into a small HMO, which is planning class C4, for a maximum of six sleeping people. That's planning, okay? So are you getting this, folks, okay? We're getting quite a few people watching now. So are you getting this? Give me a thumbs up here. Do you understand the difference between licensing and planning? I want you to tell me that they are different because loads of people still get this confused, okay? You need planning, that's number one. If you don't have the correct planning permission, there's absolutely no point in getting a license because it's irrelevant, because you can't trade it as a HMO anyway because you've not got the correct planning permission. Okay, have you got that? Cool, all right. I'm gonna just gonna push this board back over here for a minute. Okay, I've sort of beaten the drum a little bit about signing permission there. The next thing is licensing. Licensing schemes now, um, they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And we're going to talk about them in a minute. We're going to break them down. But you need to know whether or not your area has additional licensing. What does that mean? Even more confusion for you. The definition of a HMO, three or more people forming more than one household. That's the definition of a HMO. If your area has additional licensing, then you will need a license anyway. You will need a license regardless of um, uh, mandatory licensing, which we'll cover in a second, okay? So if your area has additional licensing, if you've got a HMO, which is three or more people forming more than one household, you will need a license. That's not the mandatory scheme. I'm gonna cover that in a second. And we've covered supply and demand for the area. We are going to look for properties that are close to the city centre as possible because people like the amenities around them. They like to be able to walk to work, they like to be able to walk to the train station, close to public transport links. A lot of people ask, is it essential for my HMO to have car parking? It may be if you're going for planning permission. If you're not going for planning permission, then no. Because, you know, most of our tenants, we've got 120 tenants. I would say that 85% of them don't drive. So don't worry if it hasn't got parking. You will need parking if you need planning permission. That'll be part of the planning process, usually. Not always, not always, but you know, you check with your local areas. So it's not essential that you need car parking unless you need it for planning. If you're looking for students, of course you need to make sure you're gonna be close to a university. Students don't like to walk more than 30 yards. Um, I say that with jest. Students obviously don't like to do a lot of exercise. Um, they will want a property as close to the university as, pro uh, as, as possible. But what you also need to do, folks, if you're going to do students, I would be researching that greatly because lots of student, um, uh, sorry, lots of campuses now are growing. Lots of universities are putting second year accommodation up, etc. So just make sure that you've got the stats. You know what the population of the, uh, the university is now. Is it growing? Um, if they've got any plans for any second year accommodation as well. Close to hospitals and factories. Perfect for locums, for doctors, for student nurses, etc. What sort of house is it now? And how can you maximise the floor space? So, um, for example, is it a terraced house that you can't extend on at the back, you can't go down into the cellar, and you can't go up into the loft because of planning restrictions? I don't know. Or is it a semi-detached house? Maybe with an integral garage that you can convert into another bedroom. Maybe you could put a, a dormer on the back of the house upstairs. Maybe you could convert 
the um, the living room into a bedroom, etc. So look at the makeup of the house and how you can maximise on the floor space. We look for a maximum of five bedrooms. That's what we said earlier um, for our cash flow, and of course a good return. You know we need to make a good return on the property, otherwise there is no point in doing it in the first place. Now we buy for cash flow. If we get any residual growth as well on top of that, that's perfect. But it doesn't always happen as quickly as we want to. But as long as we've got our monthly cash flow, then that's what is important to us. Um, large bedrooms to fit in a double bed. You know, that's really important. And I know a lot of the time that, you know, we are only renting to single occupants, but they still want a double bed because they want to bring guests and they are allowed to bring guests and they sell quicker. They sell easier. Good size communal areas. Now, this will be determined in your local amenity standards document. What does that mean? Um, every area will have uh, something called a dash or a amenity standard document for HMOs. And that will tell you in that document what your minimum sizes need to be for your kitchens, your living rooms, etc. We'll talk about national minimum room sizes in a minute. So you need to get hold of that document, okay? So good size communal areas. Some people um, post in the group, is it essential to have a communal area? I think it is. We never, um, we used to take them away. Um, it's, I think it's integral now to the house because people don't want to be cooked up in their room all the time. They want to be able to go and socialize. Properties that have got communal areas will be more um, attractive. You'll be able to sell them quicker and tenants will stay longer. So I think it is essential. And of course, you've got to consider if you don't have communal areas, your bedroom sizes will need to be bigger as well. Good size kitchens, again, that will be determined in your local amenity standards. Integral garages are great because we can convert them. Car parking isn't essential. Um, if you've got it, great. If you're not, it doesn't matter. En suites or non en suites, this is going to be an age old discussion. Um, I'm not about to tell you my opinions on all of that, but all I can say is that en suites, they may come with single banding for council tax. You'll have to check your area, but they will sell at a premium and your tenants potentially may stay longer. Uh, I always go back to the, you know, the, the fit and proper person test. If you were going to stay in a hotel, would you choose an ensuite over a communal bathroom? I think it's an easy answer. Um, so that's what we think about en suites. Check the demand, we've covered that. Speak to the agents in the area to see what they think about the demand. Speak to other investors, attend local property meetings. And of course, you're in my discussion group anyway. So, you know, keep that flowing, keep the, the posts moving, ask for advice in the discussion group. Okay, Article 4 planning. I'm going to cover this again because you need to get it, all right? Um, give us some thumbs up, folks. Give me some comments. If you've got any questions, post them. We do need to keep this interactive, okay? Got quite a few people here listening and watching. Thanks for the thumbs up. I can see them coming in now. Uh, post your comments there, folks. And I'm here live. I will answer your question for you. Article 4 planning. I've already done this. I'm going to do it again. Write this down. Article 4 planning is not licensing. What's it not? Tell me in the comments. I need to know that you've got this. It's not licensing, they're two completely different things, okay? You need to know this. Don't forget, that's the road, that's licensing, that's planning. It's all different, all right? So Article 4 is not licensing, it's planning, okay? I can't beat the drum anymore on that. I think you've got it, all right? Areas without Article 4, we are able to convert a dwelling house, which is planning class C3, into a small house of multiple occupation, up to six people. It's not six rooms, it's six people, all right? If you're over six people, you will need planning permission anyway, regardless, okay? Planning class C4 is Article 4. You can do it under permitted development if you don't have Article 4 direction. So enough of that, all right? Licensing, here goes, okay. Licensing. We covered additional licensing before. So if your area has additional licensing, that's three or more people forming more than one household, you will need a license anyway. The mandatory licensing scheme changed in October, okay? If you have five or more people forming more than one household, then you are gonna need a mandatory license anyway. And that's changed now. So basically, if you've got a HMO 
and it's got five people, regardless of how many floors, you need to have a mandatory HMO license. That's, that's the way it is now. They've taken away the floors. It used to be um, over three floors. It doesn't matter now. So if you've got, uh, before, under the old rules, you could have a 25 bedroom HMO on one floor and you wouldn't need a license. And it's kind of a little bit bizarre. So they've taken that rule away, and rightfully so. It's more regulation. And I agree with that. You know, the more regulation we have, then it keeps us on our toes and makes sure we've got more uh, desirable properties for our tenants. So how do you do licensing? Complete a licensing application. Easy. That's all you have to do. Um, and then, you know, follow the instructions on your local amenity standards. Make sure that your properties are compliant to those standards, and then you shouldn't have a problem. Right, now this is a big one. I'm just going to take a quick slurp. How to find deals. Deal sourcing. It's massive. Everybody wants deals. I'm going to show you a couple of my tips in a second. Just bear with me. Okay, I'm not getting many comments, folks. Come on, keep this interactive. I can see how many people are watching. Um, so give me some comments. Give me some feedback. Ask me any questions. How do we find deals? Well, Personally, this is what we do, folks. Now, you, you know, people might be watching this saying, no, it's rubbish, you know, we do it differently. That's, kind of, that's okay. You can do it differently. This is what we do. We look for motivated sellers. We look for tired landlords that are potentially about to retire or want to dispose of their properties. Landlords that might be in negative equity. They need to sell quickly for whatever reason. I don't know what the reason might be, but they need to sell quickly. They might need to relocate. Lots of reasons that people become motivated. You know, very much, sometimes people are motivated because they've um, been renting with an agent and the agent has failed to let the property. And because they failed to let the property, they're not bringing any income. Because they're not bringing any income, the property is now disheveled. It's not looking good, so they can't sell it. And it's a whole 363, 363, 360 degree circle. So then they become motivated. And that's where we can step in and help them. And we can do any of the, the strategies. We can buy the property, we could rent it from them, or we could do a lease option. It doesn't matter as long as it's a win-win. Okay. So what you don't want to be, folks, is that you don't want to be a motivated buyer. Because if you become a motivated buyer, you're going to lose money on the property. It's not, it's not going to make you the return on investment that you're looking for. So how do you find motivated landlords? Well, you can write to them directly. You can contact estate agents. We get some great deals from estate agents, folks. You know, they're all there, but they don't, they don't necessarily drop on your mat every day. So you need to build up relations with the estate agents. Letting agents the same. You could put adverts in the newspaper or you could do a leaflet drop. Right Move and Zoopla, there are deals on there all day long. Gumtree, sometimes people post deals on Facebook. You can use a deal sourcer. Um, I don't personally use deal sourcers. What I can say to you is that there are some great deal sources out there. Like everything, you know, um, there are some not so great deal sources out there. But make sure you do your due diligence and make sure that it's a deal. What does that mean? Does it work for you? You know, because what works for me might be completely different than what works for you. So I might look at a deal that's 15%. You might be looking for something that's 10% or 20%. So you've got to make sure that it is really a deal. Is it exclusive to the sourcer? Or can you just literally go on Right Move and Zoopla and buy that property anyway without having to pay a fee? Lots of things for you to consider, okay? But it does work. And of course, networking meetings. Get yourself out there, get networking, start telling people what it is that you're looking for and what it is you're looking to achieve and start to become known in your local area for what you do. It's really powerful. Uh, word of mouth. Okay, so structuring the deal, next. So we can do a straightforward purchase. We could do a joint venture purchase. We could do what we call a purchase lease option. Or we could do a rent to rent. Or we could do with an exchange with a delayed completion. Lots of different ways that you can obtain those properties. We've got several programs on each one of these folks. You know, I can't go into the ins and outs today on each one of these, but those are the ways that we look to obtain property. And I always say that if it's a great deal and if you're in a position to, just buy it. Don't overcomplicate it. At the end of the day, we want to own these properties to put into our portfolio anyway. So if it's a great deal, just literally buy it. 
negotiating next we're moving really quickly here everybody okay online give me some thumbs up folks let me know that you're still here um, otherwise i'm talking into this little black camera in front of me um i'm feeling a little bit lonely a little bit odd to be honest with you so, <laughs> so let me know you're here please okay negotiating deals so first of all we're going to speak with the vendor you can't do anything unless you talk to the other person you need to have a face-to-face -face meeting and you need to understand their expectations what is it they're looking for? Now, very often, if you're dealing directly with a vendor and you ask them the question, how much are you looking to achieve? They will probably come back and say, well, that's for you to make me an offer. And that's a really difficult starting point. But what we need to try and establish is what is their expectations? What is their motivation? Why are they looking to do this? Because without knowing what the expectations are, it's very difficult to start getting that common line that common agreement so we need to really try and establish that so we're going to have a face-to-face -face meeting i'm going to ask them what is it mr vendor that you're looking to achieve so i can understand whether or not we can help you and we can get to a win-win situation we need to understand their motivation it could be that they need to move quickly so they might take a discount on the property it could be that they want to keep the property because they can't sell it because there might still be a negative equity who knows or maybe they've got um capital gains to pay over a period of time so they can't sell it so then we are starting to understand what it is they're looking to achieve so if they're not looking to sell they don't want to manage it themselves how can we help them okay so are you looking to sell in the future so maybe the capital gain issue could be spread so if you've got five houses maybe we could set up an exchange with a delay completion or maybe a purchase lease option over that period of time to take over one of those properties per year so we can start to negotiate with them and find out what their expectations are. It's really important. And it's like anything in life, you know, with business, par business partnerships, joint venture deals. If you don't know the other person's expectations, then it's going to be very difficult for you to build that relationship. And it may break down in the future. What we're looking to do is help them and help them take away their pain. So whatever their pain is, maybe it's that the property is empty, they can't afford to pay their next mortgage payment because it's been empty for so long. Okay, well, when is your next mortgage payment? It's on the 28th. Well, how about we pay that for you? Okay, so we can come in, we can take over the property, can get the legals done quite quickly, and provided that all the ducks are in a row and everything's cool and you've got the right mortgage product, then maybe we can take over the property quickly and pay your next mortgage payment for you. So, you know, those kind of things are really big motivators. The most important thing in everything we do, you've got to be completely transparent and completely honest. We don't lie to anybody. We tell them as it is, you know. And if we're doing a lease option, we say, look, you know, it's the option to purchase, not the obligation. And we tell them all of that. We make sure that we are completely open and honest and totally transparent. And it has to be ethical. Otherwise, we just don't do it. It's got to be enough skin in the game for everybody. There's got to be enough reward for them and for us as well. It's got to be a win-win. And the other thing is that when we start negotiating on deals, we've got to make sure that we keep the vendor up to date all of the time. They need to know where we are. Maybe, you know, if a week goes by and they haven't heard from us, then potentially they think the deal's off. So we've got to make sure we keep that content, sorry, contact with the vendors all the time. All right. Um, Hi, Graham. Hi, Graham. Thank you. Ace content. Good. Glad you're enjoying it. Um, you know, loads more to come. Don't go away. And we offer them speed and certainty. So like I just said, you know, how about I give you your next mortgage payment and I can do it by the end of the month? Um, and we can get cracking now. You know, I can get to my legal team tomorrow. I could probably have the contracts drawn up by the end of the week. Yeah. And because we can do that. You know, we've got the team around us. So what happens next? We've got a whole walkthrough for you from start to finish here. So you've got your deal signed now. So we've negotiated. You've signed your deal. When do you advertise for tenants? Right now. Don't be put off because the property needs a refurbishment. Advertise for tenants as soon as you've signed for the deal. Um, because tenants will buy, well, off plan almost. Let me say off plan. You know, if you um, put your advert on Spare Room, and you can put an example photograph of maybe one of your other houses or maybe one of your friend's houses. And as long as you say on there, the advert is an example. The photograph is just an example because this property is under refurbishment. 
But we are taking uh, reservations now for the rooms. If you would like to get a brand new high spec house in an awesome area with the following mod cons, then maybe you should reserve this room now. And I can tell you that tenants will do that. So advertise for tenants straight away. Don't worry, it doesn't have to be ready. It doesn't have to be finished. And I can guarantee that you will sell the rooms off plan because tenants want to be the first ones in there. Um, and they want to be the first ones in a brand new house. So as soon as you've signed the deal, advertise for your tenants, folks. Okay, that's really important. Points to note. So you have the refurbished progress. You've begun to search for tenants. Before you start collating information on new tenants, you need to register with the ICO for data protection. Okay, really important, dead easy to do. So you need to register with the Information Commissioner's Office. You can do it online. There's like a little questionnaire that they ask you now. It's changed a little bit. And it's not expensive. I think it's about £45 or something similar for the very basic um, package, which is all you will need. So that's really important. You've got to be GDPR compliant. Okay? www.ico.gov.uk So that's the first thing you should do. So now we're going to talk about tenants. Oh, okay, so what type of demographic of tenant am I looking for? Well, you probably already sorted this out in your head when you did the due diligence um, of your area, okay? But I'm going to break down the tenant, um, tenant demographics for you. First of all, you could be looking for students. I'm going to give you the good and the bad here. Students are great because they generally, you set and forget. They're there for 10 months out of the year usually, and that means that you can just literally, you know, put them in and not worry about any churn. After 10 months, you've got two months then that you can go back into the property and you can decorate ready for the next cohort of students. Students normally come with a guarantor. Usually, I would expect you to take a guarantor. And that's normally bank of mum or dad. So if they don't pay their rent, all it takes is a very quick phone call and the money's in the bank maybe a couple of hours later. Students can um, be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you will become mum and dad quite quickly. They don't like to do anything for themselves, so they might be a little bit more work than you'd expect from a professional tenant. Um, but, you know, it works in areas that have got universities, but I will always say, and I said it before, check with your local area to make sure that the university isn't oversaturated and they're not planning to do second-year digs or big complexes that will maybe make you struggle in the following years, Okay. The next tenant, tenant demographic are what we call blue-collar workers. These are pretty much everyone that's got a job. And now, most of our portfolio is made up of blue-collar workers. And it's people that are just, you know, they could be in the care industry. They could be working in a factory. It doesn't matter. As long as they've got a provable income and they've had the job for three months or more, or they're on a contract, um, then we will consider them. Then we've got working professionals. Now, these are people generally that have got postgraduate degrees. They might be um, lawyers, doctors, etc. And they're going from being in HMO, they've got their first professional job, and now they're going from a student HMO to a professional HMO. So they've been through the student market. They know what it's about. And then we've got local housing authority tenants. That is a picture from the BBC. I am allowed to use it. It's not copyrighted. Um, I can't remember her name now, but it was... Um, is it? Benefit Street or something. The local housing authority is um, obviously when people don't have a job for whatever reason and they will be claiming um, local housing benefit. Uh, it's not my personal demographic of tenant. I've never done that. I choose not to because we go for working professionals mainly or blue collar workers because I think it's an awful lot easier for us to manage. So those are your tenant demographics. Now, folks, what I want to share with you is something really exciting. I hope you enjoyed that content, by the way. Um, you know, that's, that's just a snippet, really, of, you know, some of the courses that we do. Um, but, you know, using that content, you can get out there now and you can start investing with confidence. Um, and it's all about sharing in this group. You know that. And we give as much free content out there as we possibly can. I want to introduce you to our six-month investor program. So going back two months ago, we launched our six-month HMO investor program to a group of 10 individuals. Um, and there are now coming up to month three. Those students on that program are doing exceptionally well. And if you're watching, hi. Um, I'm not going to mention any names, but we've got loads of leads coming in. We've got one offer accepted. We're only into month two um, within the group. Loads of motivation, and they're doing really, really well. So we've created a program that allows you to come here into my office once a month and be mentored by me, where I share with you 
all of my knowledge about how you can invest into HMOs and how you can do it within six months if you choose to. You don't have to do it within six months, but the program is designed over a six month period. So we have monthly action taking sessions face to face here and it's an eight step process. We go through the process with you and you get me face to face. You also get a weekly Zoom call with me and the rest of the group to hold you accountable. So that's every single week as well. So you, not only do you get to come and meet me once a month here and you spend all day with me, you also get a weekly Zoom call as well um, with the rest of the group at the same time. We've got a private Facebook group and then you also have private access to me directly if you need me in the meantime. So you can pick up the phone and call me. You get my direct phone number as well. So if you've got any panic calls or you need some help with something, then you can contact me directly. There's a money back guarantee with this as well, folks. And um, what we need to do is just explain to you exactly what the benefit that you get. So it's called Investor. So we're looking now to um, grow our investor program into next year. So if you're looking to change what you do, and if you're looking to you know, really take a grip of investing in property using HMOs specifically, this is just for HMOs, then we're looking to help another group of 10 people, which will be starting in February. Okay, so if you're looking to really change what you do for 2019 as part of your New Year's resolutions, then you really need to consider joining our next group of investors. It's six months. We will fast track your journey. And this is for people that want action now. This is for people that are looking um, and are happy to be um, to be pushed out of their comfort zone into the next level. So if you really are looking to you know, progress, um, if you're new to property and you really need that helping hand, then this may well be the program that will suit you perfectly, okay? There is a guarantee. If you're not happy with the course content after month one, then we'll give you all of your money back in full. The eight step investor program is broken down into obviously eight steps. Number one, the first month we cover identify. And that's where we identify your goals and we identify your area. Number two, we look at niche. Niching will enable you to focus on the right type of property. Whether you need planning permission in your area and what that means. Then we move on to view. You should never buy a house without viewing it. So we give you all of the tools and a breakdown of conversion costs. So we've broken everything down from plastering walls to rewiring to putting smoke alarms up. And we give you an individual cost of what we pay in our area right now. So it gives you an indication on exactly how much it will be to convert your HMO property. Then we have evaluate. Then we move on to sign, then transform, occupy, and repeat. So we've created an easy to follow eight step process that will help you from, from nothing, from getting into the property investing journey, from nothing with no experience, all the way through to managing your own tenants and cash flowing your property within six months. This is a fast track program, folks, designed to accelerate your success in six months, to work directly with me and a small group of people face to face. Now the cost for this program is 5,000 pounds plus VAT. I'm telling you that now folks, because we are open and honest with everything. Now that is a small investment to pay in order to be able to change your lives moving forwards, all right? I'm telling you the price now because I don't want you to say, Rick, I'm really interested in this. Oh, but I can't afford it. So like everything we do, we are providing you with all the information right up front. Now, if you are an action taker, if you'd like to work with me directly, you know, on a, a small group of 10 people uh, in my office once a month, if you're looking for that handholding for 2019, if you're looking to change your life through property and you can do this, then please comment yes below and I will arrange for a one-to-one -one call with me um, probably now after the Christmas break. Um, but if you want to do it sooner, then that's fine. But we've only got 10 spaces, folks. When we released this on the first investor program, we had over 100 applicants and we had to get down to 10 people because it's not for everyone. It's not going to be for everyone. It is quite a challenge. All right. So folks, we have got 10 spaces. Book a call with me. I will talk you through it. If you need any more information, then please let me know. And in the meantime, have a great day. Hope you enjoyed today's content. Please don't forget to comment below if you're interested in booking that one-to-one -one strategy call with me. Thanks a lot, folks. Take care.
Go Tenant, the revolutionary new property software built by landlords and trusted by tenants. Go Tenant is your one-stop property management assistant that will take the pain away from your tenant recruitment process and the management of your properties. From advertising your property to maintenance reporting, electronic signatures to full property management software. Stop worrying about double bookings and the hassle of unnecessary admin. Because Go Tenant is here to enable you to seamlessly run your portfolio from anywhere in the world. Go to gotenants.co.uk to find out more.